And and it is true that you become much more productive doing that. Power to Live More with Joe Dodds. Welcome to the Power to Live More podcast, all about productivity, organisation, well-being, energy and resilience. I'm Jo Dodds and I started this show to enable interesting people to share their stories about how they use their power to live more and by that I mean to do the stuff that they want to do more than the stuff that they need to or should do. It's about creating a life for yourself where you have the energy, health and space to be happy and fulfilled, spending your time as you'd like, whether that be at work, home or somewhere else entirely. That's your choice. Hello. My name is Ellie Dodds and I am co-presenter and today Joe's interviewing Jackie Handy of Runway Global. Jackie was introduced to us by Helena Holrick from show number 167. Jackie has supported hundreds of individuals in organisations around the world in accelerating performance. She's a TEDx and event speaker, training consultant and author. Through her personal and professional experience, Jackie has developed a deeper understanding of human behaviour and why we do what we do, as well as how accepting or challenging we are about the behaviour of others. Jackie believes that inclusion can be simple if we all commit to taking small behavioural steps consistently, and that when we all do a little, the world can change a lot. Back to the studio. Today I'm interviewing Jackie Handy of Runway Global. Welcome Jackie, thanks for joining me. Hi Jo, it's great to be here, thank you. Yeah, so tell me a bit first about who you are, what you do and where you do it. Gosh, right, um, so who am I? Um, well, I, um, I'm basically, uh, I work with leaders in organisations, I'm a training consultant, I'm a professional speaker um, and I'm an author actually as well. Um, and basically what I do is I, uh, I work in training soft skills, leadership skills uh, in organisations. My background is uh, I used to be a recruiter, recruitment consultant, so that was my in, if you like, to the training world. Um, I started doing recruitment training, then moved into leadership development, and then I started my own business, Runway Global, six and a half years ago. Um, and there's a there's a story to it. Um, but good, good. My, <laughs> good, that's what we want. Um, but the story is that um, I uh, I'd gone into learning and development, and 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 I think actually it was really interesting because I went into that field at around about 38. Um, I'd never been, I never would consider myself particularly academic at school. And so I was one of these kids that, you know, just wanted to get out of school and earn a living. And, um, and then when I moved into learning and development, at, 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 like I say, about around about 38, I I thought, God, I really want to learn more things. And, and I approached learning quite head on, actually. I got involved in neurolinguistic programming, um, not just involved, but I came, became a master practitioner and trainer of NLP. Um, I got involved in things like Myers-Briggs type indicator, became a certified practitioner there and everything disc practitioner. I mean, it just goes on and on, really. <laughs> a, a Lego serious play facilitator. Um, and and I, it, it, I think moving into um, the arena of learning and development actually kind of was the catalyst for me wanting to learn more. So, and, and I love human behavior and why we do what we do. And I think the reason behind that is just two and a half years ago, I got introduced to um, uh, what you might have heard of the Professional Speaking Association, the PSA. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an organization for new and established speakers and speaking professionals. So whether you're a trainer, coach, et cetera. And, and I started to practice speaking on stage, um, obviously to a wider audience rather than facilitating a training session, for instance. And, and I started telling my own story and my own story, my personal story is that I was, I was bullied growing up because of a number of differences that I had. Uh, the first of which I was very young. Um, I was about four. I had a, a lazy eye, which meant my left eye turned inwards. I looked different from all the other kids in my street and, and basically 
I didn't really realize I was different until they pointed it out. And, um, mm-hmm. uh, and so I had this whole kind of, uh, outsider, you know, I'd been in the in crowd as it were, and I became an outsider and I was bullied and laughed at and pointed at and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then thankfully that got rectified. You know, I had an operation to correct the, um, the squint in the eye and uh, I was back in the in crowd again until um, I was around 14, 15. And, you know, that time in a teenager's life, everything's changing, hormones are kicking in. And I realized that I wasn't like the other girls in my class because I didn't like boys like they did. Mm. Um, and, and I realized and finally admitted to myself that I was gay. Um, and... I told a couple of people in the school about it, uh, as teenagers do, they talk, not maliciously, but words soon got round and and I suddenly ended up in the, uh, you know, at the outsider again. So the bullying happened again. And this is the story. I mean, there's much more to it, but this is the story that I started to share on the stage. And, um, and because of that, if you like, I, um, I managed to get, lots of opportunities to speak in different areas and in September 2018 I delivered a talk on the TEDx stage Um, my talk's called the exclusive nature of inclusion where I shared that story in a little more detail and um, and suddenly I started to get contacted about doing diversity and inclusion work in organizations alongside their leadership development programs and so all of a sudden, I say all of a sudden, it's funny, isn't it? You, you work for 30 years and all of a sudden you think you've had a lucky break. But actually, yes. <laughs> we, all, we all know that, you know, everything that you've done and spent your time becoming an expert in over the years suddenly comes together. And, and I think that was the moment that it kind of came together. And I realized that, you know, I've got a recruitment background. So from a diversity and inclusion perspective, recruitment is really important to me and the way in which we recruit people into our organizations and and retain and engage them. Secondly, um, I absolutely believe that um, the leaders in organizations and the leaders of the future really need to be invested in and equipped to manage other people. And, you know, I've been a manager and it's it's bloody tough and um, and it can be very lonely and isolating. So I, I was very passionate about upskilling and equipping them. And of course, the whole diversity and inclusion strand, which I was very authentically experienced, um, you know, and, and, mm. and capable of being able to roll out in terms of uh, learning and development seem to come together as a real golden thread. You know, mm. humanity is the golden thread, isn't it? Mm. Um, and so that's kind of now what I'm doing. I say kind of, I, I make that sound like I'm not really, I am doing. Um, <laughs> so I work with leadership teams uh, and organizations as a whole, helping them embed um, leadership and inclusion strategies throughout their businesses. That's what I do. That was a very long answer for uh, kind of who I am and what I do. Really, but there you go. It was. It's great, and it gives me lots to work with. Um, and um, and where are you based? And are you based from home? Uh, yeah, but well, I'm based from home at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I think that most of the world is based from home at the time of this recording. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm in Shropshire. So I'm right in the uh, the sort of Midlands, uh, which is great, actually. I've, I've only recently moved to this area in October of last year. I'm a Midlands girl through and through, um, although uh, I do tend to have uh, twangs of funny accents depending on where I'm travelling to, where I've been. I seem to pick a bit of everything up. Um, but, yeah, I'm in the Midlands, and, uh, yes, I... I mean, even before the COVID-19 situation hit and lockdown and all the rest of it, you know, I, I did some por- portion of my work working from home. Mm-hmm. Um, so actually that whole transition wasn't too challenging for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's actually been quite enjoyable in many ways. Um, yes. so, although I'd rather that we weren't forced to be locked down, you know, that, that can be, I recognise, quite stressful for a lot of people. Yes, yeah, but, yeah. exactly. So I'm interested, you talked about... Um, joining the PSA as being sort of a, a, a trigger, a sort of pivotal moment in your career. Mm. Um, had the sort of diversity conversation, if you like, been something that had, had been there for you throughout your career or is it, or did they draw that out of you as a, as a story to use to inspire yeah. people? 
Interesting, interesting. Um, great question, actually. So um, I suppose the, the easy answer about perhaps was I out of the closet, mm. um, which is perhaps a good place to start, is um, yes and no. So um, I, you know, I'm, I'm 47 now. Uh, but we won't tell everyone. Oh dear, I just did. <laughs> no one's listening, um, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, no <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I, I, I came out, as I've just mentioned, as a teenager, at, uh, I was 15, mm. and, um, and, and I, because, I think, of that initial um, response from yeah. my school friends, um, and some of the challenges that I faced on the journey and the fear that I went through. Um, anybody that's listening that's ever either had a uh, had to have one of these kind of conversations, either as the the the, the, the receiver or, or the uh, you know the person delivering the message, mm. will know just how scary it can be. Um, and and I think I was just I just didn't want to have to go through that whole. Will people treat me differently? Will people treat me differently again? So mm. um, although those nearest and dearest to me knew, um, I wasn't actually initially out of the closet in my work. And mm. you know, my early work, as, as, as many young sort of 20-somethings do, I was a holiday rep for four years, um, which took me you know, to a few lovely places around the world. And, um, and, but it was the most personally lonely time for me um because to be honest i i think it was kind of straightsville um dare i say um you know it it was interesting because and i use very much a stereotype in the context of my experience was um the girls were man eaters and and the boys were gay (laughs) So, so uh, I mean, it wasn't quite straight spill, but it was from a, a, a kind of lesbian perspective. Um, it, it was a very challenging time for me. And, yeah. and it was just easier to say nothing most of the time. And, you know, over the years, there have been a handful of people that I've confided in. Um, I worked in recruitment for 15 years and, and I didn't actually... Um, come out of the closet officially until I was an established manager in a very successful team um, and and I just met my now wife um, and that was at the end of 2007 so um, and even now actually I mean it's not my opening line but then would anybody's opening line be hi I'm heterosexual you know so yeah, yeah. so it's just one of those things that I'm now much more open and uh you know blimey if i if i can't be true to myself then what's the point and i mm. think you know perhaps perhaps your listeners will will recognize that you know i think when you um whatever it is when you're in a position where you can live your truth i don't need to broadcast it into everybody's face if you like if it's not appropriate to do so but if somebody asks me about me well that that is part of who I am um but I but I stress it's a part of who I am it's Mm. it's not my complete identity and I I think like all human beings you know we're multifaceted um but yeah it's uh, I think when I joined the PSA I did decide that um you know, when you give a, 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 spe- a speech on a stage, um, obviously depending on to which audience, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, things around thinking about what you want the audience to take away, what do you want them to learn. In fact, very little of the speech is, a, is about the speaker. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. You know, it, the, the, the speaker, a bit like the trainer, perhaps even a bit like the coach, is really the vessel through which the, the recipient learns and is prompted to take action Mm. and so um i I really feel that you know we i've said it before i'll say it again you know when we leverage the power of humanity in all its forms we really have the possibility to make magic happen um Mm. that doesn't Mm. sound too cheesy you know because we we bring so much value Mm. unique to the world and so my story just became the vessel for that yes Mm. And, uh, you know, you use the, 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 the phrase, you know, speak your truth. I think, mm. you know, the, uh, I think generally there's two types of speakers. There's the speakers that, that, that give you the veneer um, and there's the people who give you the truth and, and or their truth. And that, 
that is what makes a really great speaker, I think. I think the others can appear great, but somewhere along the line, the crack comes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, in, in many ways, you're right. Um, I think, you know, there are a bit like, you know, coaches, trainers, in, anybody in the world, but there, there are speakers that will suit different audiences. And I mm. guess, you know, if... Um, if it depending on what that speaker's message is about you know i i like to think that some speakers speak from the head or speak to the head and then others speak from the heart to the heart mm. and um and what we often find we tend to hold with us longer is the heart <laughs> because it touches something within us doesn't it and yes. um, so i think that's probably where your comment comes from there in that you know the those that really are truly vulnerable up on a stage and open themselves up in order to convey their message um seem to touch us much more um yeah yes. it's been my experience too yeah. mm -hmm. so we touched on the fact that you're now um based from home <laughs> for, <laughs> for much of what you do the same as as you say um yeah, yeah. you know many people around the world Tell us a bit more how, how that's sort of played out for you because you, you did travel um, a lot, you said you before we came on um, generally and, and, you know, your work took you to clients and so on. How, how have things changed for you now? Oh, gosh, well, I think um, probably like most people, they've changed, they've changed massively, but, um, but it hasn't all been um, a, a, a negative journey. In fact, the vast majority of it has been very, very positive for me. I feel very, very lucky, actually. Um, first of all, um, I moved to the wonderful Shropshire countryside in October. So, you know, uh, as as I speak to you now, I'm looking out uh, at fields and sheep beyond. So mm -hmm. I'm in a wonderful, very, very blessed situation in terms of my lockdown is based in somewhere um, very pleasant to be. Mm -hmm. um, so that's helpful. Um, I think it, from a work perspective, what's been really interesting, um, uh, of course, you know, like many people, um, you know, training clients, uh, speaking engagements have had to be cancelled or postponed. Um, and so initially, you know, there's a big shock, isn't there, to the system. Um, but I found because of the training work that I do, and actually I, I delivered training on virtual platforms way before, um, you know, COVID-19. And so many of my clients were saying, look, is there a way that we can make this a virtual session? And in the vast majority of cases, then yes, it is. Um, so I've been able to actually do much more than I'd anticipated work-wise because those same clients have maybe come to me and said, look, um, you know, if, if I've seen it once, I've seen it a million times, you know, how to thrive through lockdown type thing, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. in a virtual world. So, you know, yeah, I was one of those people. I, um, you know, I created some uh, sessions which I delivered. I delivered to um, uh, China. I delivered to Australia. I delivered to the States. I delivered to places that actually... Um, client budgets probably wouldn't have dictated they'd have flown me out there to do it mm. so actually it, it presented a very nice opportunity for me to engage internationally but from the comfort of my own home mm. Mm. and um, I think one of the one of the biggest challenges that I've always found with working from home actually is is stopping yes <laughs> it's <laughs> and it, it's not it's not starting it's it's stopping and mm. um, you know I'm uh, I find that um, if I'm not careful, I will be sat in my office until just literally. I mean, I've had days where, um, you know, half past seven, I'm sat in, my, in the morning, I'm sat in the office. And but for a couple of breaks, short breaks here and there, you know, I'll still be sat in my office at sort of half seven, eight o'clock at night. And, mm. you know, it's that whole as you go to get up off your chair, you realise that you've been sat in the same position for far too long, <laughs> yeah. and um, and you know you're you're getting a bit the wrong side of um, forty to not stand up and take a few um, you know strolls around the office. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think uh, that's been challenging. Um, yeah, I think I I found that challenging considering what I do. You know, and I talk about 
you know, being clear about what you want to do and what you don't want to do and aligning your activity with it and all those other things, you'd think yeah. I'd have sort of got this sussed. But what I re- have realized is that, um, well, firstly, I don't know how I'm going to fit any of my normal life back into the life <laughs> I now have because I don't seem to have <laughs> any time. Um, but also, I think a lot of my stopping was by going out of the house to do things. So I yeah. sing in a number of choirs and, you know, play netball and things like that. And, and oh, no. that was my stopping. And because no. I don't have those things and mm. even, you know, seeing friends and so on, you know, I've, I've sort of zoomed with friends and, and now we um, meet them in the garden sort of thing. Mm. Um, but you know, there were, there were so few of those things happening that yeah. I was filling it with work stuff. And it's like, well, you know, I have got other things I can do in the house. <laughs> but it seemed yeah. like I hadn't realised that most of my downtime, if you like, was actually out of the house doing other things yeah, rather than right. being in the house, not working. And so that's been quite challenging, working out how to stop working whilst staying in the house. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. And, um, you know, I I have generally speaking got my head around it all i mean you know i'm a dog owner um so you know that there, there's a uh, you know you've obviously got to go and take your dog for a walk mm-hmm. so um and of course as lockdown has eased um that bit more i'm able to go to i'm surrounded by the wire forest on the doorstep which is wonderful for dog walking mm-hmm. and um and i I do just love peace and quiet. You can probably tell from where I've chosen to live. Uh, I like peace and quiet. So just to go and walk the dog in the woods, I think is very, um, it's like a a mind numbing, but very heart centered activity, isn't it? Just to be Mm. in a forest and be with nature and, um, uh, and quite an unusual thing as well is that um, where we live now, our next door neighbor closest neighbor is a farmer a sheep farmer and um and she's she's reasonably elderly and uh and her husband unfortunately just prior to the lockdown had to go into a care home mm-hmm. which which was the best place for him to be honest with his condition but um so um myself and my wife go around and we help her out with the sheep uh and so uh, <laughs> most mornings actually now although i've said you know sometimes i'm in from 7 30 generally speaking now um i'll uh i'll go around to hers help feed the lambs make sure that the sheep are all all right and uh, uh and, and there's a couple of lambs i mean it's so cute there's a couple of lambs that are still being bottle fed they're, they're not yet weaned um yeah. so you know i mean it's a tough job but someone's got to do it so uh, bottle feed some of the lambs and i mean if there's uh, if there's a a better way to start your day i haven't yet found it because this is just tops the lot you know to to go around and see the sheep and the lambs in the morning so, I, think you've, I think you've topped the um the guests in terms of things that you do in your spare time i don't think i've spoken <laughs> to anyone who's rearing uh, sheep do you know what <laughs> you no know, i haven't even started yet because I, I, I you can't see this but um when i went to a, a speaker's convention uh, last year there was a, a gentleman who's extremely extremely funny who um who who basically he's he's a comedy speaker talks about putting comedy into into his uh, speeches yeah and um and he got a few of us up on stage to attempt to play the nose flute <laughs> now, you may be wondering what that is well it is in fact a um it is a plastic thing <laughs> basically goes over your nose and and your mouth it's not like a mask (laughs) but and and you blow through your nose and play the flute now um so i have oodles of fun um if i just need some uh empty the head time you know some get ready before a call or whatever i can't play it i'll I'll, hang on hang on oh there we are i managed to (laughs) so that (laughs) so this (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so this is my nose flute which i keep in my desk uh, tray just uh yeah just for no reason other than it makes me laugh and just yes. reminds me of that you know <laughs> well i have i have two stories of my youth that i'm reminded of by what what you've just told me firstly i went to a friend's birthday party when i was about nine wearing my white bomber jacket <laughs> you know clearly you know on trend on trend exactly um <laughs> Uh, until one of the lambs, because she lived on a farm, um, yep. did a rather nice yellow poo down it. No. <laughs> I don't think we got that out. I think I had to throw it away. <laughs> um, I couldn't turn it into a sort of feature. Um, and 
The second one on the nose flute thing is that I used to be um, particularly good at playing two recorders from my nose. So one, <laughs> one on each nostril. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm really ambidextrous that I could actually do the notes with each hand. Uh, so nose. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Well, yeah, I'm with you on the sheep poo. Um, I, I, I do feel that if I haven't stepped in a fresh sheep poo if, <laughs> each morning, then my work is not yet wasted, complete. Yeah, you've wasted the morning, yeah. obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knew that the podcast was going to take this turn? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Oh, dear. So, getting us back slightly on track, let's talk a bit about how you deliver what you do and how you sort of get things done and make sure that you're um, getting done what you need to get done. Obviously, yeah, Zoom plays a big part in it now. <laughs> it, it, yeah, well, absolutely. I, uh, no more nose flute for now. But yeah, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not always the... Uh, well, I'm not at all the most technical of individual. Um, you know, when I talk about the fact that I deliver training, uh, you know, virtually, internationally and whatever, um, there should be a caveat to say that it's either generally on Zoom because I can navigate my way around that or it's via a platform that the client provides that I know how to use, if you like. Yeah. So I'm certainly no big tech guru. Um, you know, how do I get things done? Honestly, it's as simple as having a list and putting stuff in the diary. Um, I do love a post-it note. Um, so I do have a tendency some days to be surrounded by uh, said things. Um, but then, of course, I, as soon as I've done something, I can just uh, scrub, scribble it up and, and, and off it goes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, an online uh, uh, calendar fiend uh, because... Uh, I've got a MacBook and I've got an iPhone and I'm not on commission from Apple, but <laughs> they are supposed to um, basically tally up, right? They sync. Yeah, yeah. But I've had just one or two very close calls whereby I've looked at my calendar on my MacBook and what I thought I was doing that day, I wasn't because <laughs> there's something else that's in the calendar that hasn't synced. So I do have slight kind of, right, I have to check the phone and the calendar, make sure they sync for the day. Um, but you know what? Good old pen and paper does it for me as well. I think it's, it's quite interesting. You know, I told you that um, uh, my L&D career has kind of uh, instigated this new love of learning. And, um, and I'm currently... Uh, undertaking a neuroscience course um, and and it's fascinating it's popping my head off a little bit but it's fascinating and mm -hmm. and it, it works very well alongside the um, the NLP work that I did because yeah. anybody that knows will know that NLP is not a science it's an art but some of the uh, work that you learn in NLP uh, there are some connections to neuroscience and and it's really important for me as a as a professional trainer and speaker to be anything that I talk about in relation to the brain and how the brain works and influences our behavior and such like is actually backed up by the right stuff and um, and I'd always known that you know multitasking was a myth but you know during this course I've realized that yeah it really is. And, and actually what our brain does is rather than have the capacity to multitask, it just switches its attention. And the more times you switch your attention, actually, the more the impact of that switching has on your long term memory over a period of time. And mm. um, and that makes me realise, that answers a lot for me <laughs> because it makes me realise why, why I can't remember what I did very often in my childhood, you know, and things like that, um, other than a few moments. Because I think I've been one of those people that so often I do try and multitask or switch my attention. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, God, it's so much better when, as I, today I've had a great day because today I've just said, right, all I'm doing today is one piece of work and uh, and, and this conversation with you. And that's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a long piece of work that I was doing, but it was just that. So that just had my complete attention, my whole focus. And, and it is true that you become much more productive doing that. So I think planning can be hard. And especially over these recent months, 
you know, there's been so many people when we first went into lockdown, I thought it was going to have a meltdown because not because of lockdown, but because so many people were trying to steal my time really. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, people almost felt that, oh, well, we're, we're in lockdown now, so we can have a Zoom for an hour. Um, but actually, I was quite busy. Um, so it, it was quite difficult to keep up because I didn't like saying no to people, you know, that, that that typical kind of want to please. So I didn't like to say no to people and so on. And it was really draining me. This whole mm. Zoom fatigue was like, it's a, it's a, it's a real thing. It's yes. totally a real thing. Yeah. Um, so I do that. Um uh with the standards i've learned to say no a little bit more now for the zoom meeting so that's evened out quite nicely i've learned Mm -hmm. to focus on um as much as possible you know one key thing at a time so Um, i've got a question there you said you you've worked literally on one thing today aside from this conversation yeah how how do you make that happen because that you know is like the sort of pinnacle of (laughs) of focus and time management and everything else but most people won't do that can't do that they they would like to or they think it's the thing to do but actually you know this thing things beeping here and things that you need to do there and just that feeling of overwhelm because you've got a big long list that you're not looking at (laughs) how how have you how how have you got yourself into that zen mode (laughs) mode so you can just work on that (laughs) (laughs) i'm not not sure i'd quite go so far as zen i'd say that um, it's probably been a, a combination of um um, if I'm honest, I'd love to have a wonderful answer that was like genius for <laughs> everyone to take away. But truth be told, I've had a manic few days prior and I'm just like, I can't do this anymore. So I just need to do one thing. Yeah. But, but actually, if I could repeat that, I know. Um, and, and the days that I, and I do sometimes do it, to be fair. And, um, and the days that I do, I think that we have to um, really think about, do I... Do I actually have to have my email on? Do I? And, you know, if it pings, do I have to respond to it? Um, you know, if I have let it on. Mm. And, and, and if you, I don't know, I think unless you're waiting on something that is um, spe- particularly important and you know it's going to be not a life or death situation, but you understand where I'm going, you know, a real yeah. priority, yeah. then do we really have to? be drawn away from what we're doing Mm -hmm. and you know I I train this stuff time management with people and and honestly my first opening line is there is no magic wand for time management I think the the key is prioritizing isn't it and it's Mm -hmm. recognizing the importance of something over and above something else so for me today I realized that for my own sanity my own headspace um that that piece of work had to be my focus today because if I was switching out, checking social, doing this, doing that every five minutes, then, then that piece of work would basically drag on and drag on and drag on. And I wanted to get it done. And furthermore, I wanted to get it done well. Mm. So, um, you know, we're of course prone to making more mistakes, uh, you know, when we're switching out and switching back and forth all the time and being distracted by things. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think, you know, it, it, it's about being able to say, this is more important than that. You know, this piece yeah. of work is more important than me checking my emails. This piece of work is more important than me checking my social media or whatever, you know. And mm-hmm. and I do try with my social, because I do try and have a presence on social media, mainly um, mainly with LinkedIn and, and Facebook, to be honest with you. I, I probably don't do enough, some people would say, on, on things like Twitter and Instagram. But... Um, but what I do is I try and um, get my posts uh, thought through in advance. Um, I use a, f- a fabulous, here's a little one for your listeners. Um, I create a lot of video content and there are people that say, oh no, I hate video, hate video, don't like myself on video. Um, my advice and, and very with kindness get over it. Um, <laughs> and, I, and, and, I, and I say that with kindness because, um, you know, m- my thought process on this is people will judge you anyway. So, um, you know, there'll always be people that like what you have to say, don't like what you have to say, like your hair, think you're fat, think you're lovely, whatever, you know, so there's always going to be people judging you anyway. So I'd rather be visible and 
and they're not, if that makes sense. Um, yes. and, yeah. and a lot of work and referrals and, uh, come from that visibility in my world. Mm -hmm. So I use this great um, uh, website called Veed. Um, that's v -E -E -D dot io. So they're, um, uh, I think that's a, an Irish website. Um, they're reasonably new to the whole video editing piece. Now, I told you earlier, I'm a bit of a technophobe. So I tend to do the videos either, I either video myself on a Zoom call, if you like. Yeah. That's really easy to do. Or sometimes it's just traditionally on the iPhone. So there's no kind of big snazzy camera equipment. But super important for me and I would hope for everybody is um you know especially in my DNI space it's really important that that video is accessible for everybody so I always subtitle my videos um and there's various different apps and bits and pieces that you can use but I found Veed to be super super simple um it just does it all for you basically auto subtitles it if you really want to be technical you can add music you can add emojis and things like that but i use what i tend to do is i'll block record so i'll maybe have a day where i record three or four short videos get them onto veed subtitle them and of course uh, so not only for those deaf and hard of hearing but also the fact that most people watch them with the sound off um, so they are subtitle ready and then um, i know that there are some great apps that you can use like buffer uh, Hootsuite and so on to sort of schedule but I'm never actually quite as organized in that regard as I'd like to be so mm. I just mm. tend to post them sort of first thing in the morning if I'm going to yeah. uh, and that's done and then that's done and and then of course it's resisting the urge to keep going in to see oh I wonder if anybody else has liked it oh, has anyone commented <laughs> um, uh, yeah. and you know and, and just doing that a bit later on so Another long-winded answer, Joe, but you know, I don't believe there's a magic bullet. I think it it really is about discipline and mm. prioritizing, and yeah. it's not always easy. Sometimes I nail it, and sometimes I don't. Mm. Um, you know, that's the honest truth. Lovely, thank you. And another um, question about um, you've talked about learning uh, mm. and doing lots of learning, and in fact, I, one question I did want to ask you is your um, I can't remember how you described it. Your professional Lego. Um, learning. Do, do you have to learn how to walk on it as well? <laughs> <laughs> like in the dark whilst finding the way to the loo. Um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, quite, quite. Um, yeah, so Lego Serious Play is just like amazing. Um, it, it really is like business stuff through building with Lego. Mm. Um, and um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, um, but it, it, it basically was something that, of course, Lego is a Danish organization. And, um, and apparently this came about, there's a bit of a story, but Lego Serious Play came about when um, Lego were really out of fashion some years ago. Mm. And they needed to think about ways to become more strategic and, you know, get their business on track, if you like. And, and apparently a couple of um, coaches uh, went into Lego and they said, right, if we just, and, and this all makes sense, actually, if we, um, if we sit and make a list or we brainstorm on a flip chart or we create a mood board or whatever, that is two dimensional learning. But if we build something, actually what that creates within us is three-dimensional learning. So there's just more at play. And the, there's a, the, the theory is that you, you can become more creative that way. Mm -hmm. So the theory really behind Lego Serious Play is that you would pose a question. Oh, by the way, they managed to find a new way forward and, you know, catapulted the Lego brand once again. Um, but, but basically what you would do is you would, you would maybe work with teams that were either looking to um, solve a problem or perhaps uh, increase customer engagement. You can use it for a number of things, uh, define their team values, organizational values. And you basically, uh, you can do it in many ways, but fundamentally people build a representation of the solution. And um, so you wouldn't necessarily say, oh, I've built a person in a sports car because that means everyone's going to get rich. But instead, you can build anything you like. And, and it would be a case of the facilitator really 
checking in with that person on their building and saying, hey, this red brick here, what does that represent? And this whole act of them thinking about, oh, I didn't really consider that that meant anything, but now you're asking, maybe it means this. It just, can you tell how it would bring out so much more creativity actually? And mm -hmm. it, it's fascinating. And, um, and there's all sorts of things you can do with it, to be honest. Um, and I just skimmed the surface there, but yeah. um, it, it's a very interesting and entertaining way of learning, which I think just adds very nicely to a traditional two-dimensional learning methodology. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but without the treading on it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so just before we move into the last couple of questions of the interview, um, you've written a book whilst we've been in lockdown, haven't you? Tell us more about that. Actually, I have. Yeah, <laughs> like, there, there we are. Thanks for asking. <laughs> um, yeah, do you know, it's, um, it is interesting. I mean, you know, we we I, know, I think we talked about this before we began recording but you know that this whole kind of oh are you going to sort of learn a new language while you're in lockdown <laughs> and, and and actually so many people are just like oh my god if only I had the time and and for much of the lockdown period I've been I've been one of those people you know I just haven't got the time because I'm focusing on things yeah. but what it has enabled me to do because I think I'm spending less time on trains, planes, in cars, on motorways and traffic jams, and instead, you know, from the comfort of home, it's got me, um, it's given me the space to put together something I've been looking to put together for a while. And my work, as you know, is uh, to help uh, create and embed inclusive practices in organisations. Mm -hmm. And and I'd thought for a while about creating a, like a desktop flip book you know these kind of you know some people have desktop calendars that they they're wire bound and they yeah. flip over and so on this rather than a calendar this is a, a book I've called it the little book of belonging and it's your weekly guide to inclusive habits and and basically what it is so it's got a bit of spiel from me at the front you know suggesting how uh, people can get the most of it and that it will challenge their thinking and get them reflecting and hopefully provoke um, positive action. And then I've, I've changed the way I'm working with D&I, so diversity and inclusion. Lots of organisations focus on things like unconscious bias and becoming aware of our biases and, and, and you know, avoiding being biased as much as we can. Or perhaps we focus on discrimination awareness training and you know, be really careful not to do the wrong thing. Now, those two things are important, but my belief is that they're actually also often off-putting for people in organisations because they feel guilty about having these biases and they don't want to open up about it. Mm. Um, even though we all have biases to an extent. So what I wanted to do is to create something much more positive around the inclusion space. And so what this book does is it focuses on the behaviours that we demonstrate every day, but from the specific um, perspective of inclusion. So, for example, um, if we understand one another at a much deeper level in terms of what, how we identify, what our values and belief systems are. And I'm doing that with a colleague in an organization and they are opening up to me about their identity and values as well. That creates a really lovely platform of understanding to enhance that working relationship, to act as a springboard really for other conversations. And and so the book asks a question each week um, and it might be around uh, what more I can do to educate myself, how I can create safe spaces for people to open up, how I can work harder to be courageous and vulnerable about what I still don't understand about the people around me. So it doesn't necessarily tell you, you must do this, 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 this and this, but it says in, instead, reflect on this in your life and what you could do differently there's a great question in there about you know what um if if people respond defensively to me what might i have said or done that caused that and so 
rather than if somebody responds defensively, um, you can do this and do this and do this. Instead, it's asking people to self-reflect, to say, well, could I have done something that actually caused that person's behavior? And, and that just gets people thinking differently. Yes. And, 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 you know, just as an aside as well, I've put a very nice little motivational quote on each page as well. So each week you've got a nice quote um, to inspire and, and motivate, and then you've got a question for reflection and, uh, and thought. So, yeah, the little book of belonging. Yeah, it's, uh, and it's designed, it's, uh, it is your weekly guide to inclusive habits. So it's, it's designed for 52 weeks of the year, something each week to, to focus on, which, of course, will help create new habits. Sounds lovely. Well done, you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm done chuffed with it, actually. I'm really pleased with it. Yeah, so yeah. I hope it'll bring a lot of, um, you know, a lot of support and help and, and enlightenment to people. In yes, yeah. 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 So last couple of questions. Firstly, what about on those days where it all goes horribly wrong? How do you deal with those? <laughs> um, well, other than a large gin. Um, <laughs> But, uh, not, not in the middle of my day, I hasten to add. But um, uh, I, I think there is, at the risk of sounding a bit cheesy, because I don't want to make out that I'm some sort of saint, you know, yeah, I do get frustrated uh, at times when things go wrong. Um, I, uh, uh, yeah, I, I do. You know, I think I, think I, I anyone would lie if they said they didn't have a response to these things. But what I do try to remind myself is of a great quote um, that simply says this too will pass and and I think we have to remind ourselves of things like that in life whether whether we're going through um, a, a troubling or challenging or difficult time or literally just everything's gone to the wall that day and we should equally remind ourselves when things are going well mm. um, because I, I think life is a series of ebbs and flows and, you know, we can't appreciate that good things exist if we haven't experienced the polar opposite because otherwise every, just life is just life, isn't it? So, we, yeah. Yeah. you know, life gives us these challenges and, uh, you know, things going wrong that, that just create that balance for us. So I think that, um yeah there are often days that that things go wrong and um i get incredibly frustrated at my lack of technical prowess when i want <laughs> to be much more efficient and effective with things that i think this should be so simple and i'm one of those people that you know it might take one person you know, two minutes to do and it could take me half a day to navigate and get my head around it so that frustrates the hell out of me um i uh, i get frustrated sometimes because if I'm honest, I'm a little bit of a control freak in terms of I don't really want to outsource too much, even though all the experts tell you to do that, because I just like to know what's going on with things. Mm. But then obviously that creates a workload and, and extra challenges. Um, but I, I do think generally speaking, when we're able to give ourselves, first of all, I think giving ourselves permission is really important. Give yourself permission to just have a bit of a crack day, you know? Yeah. Um, but don't stay there. That's, that's the key, isn't it? It's, it? it's going, right, okay, this too will pass. Today's been a bit of a crap day, which means that tomorrow is likely to be better. Mm. And, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of sleeping on things, uh, as in <laughs> not on things like a book <laughs> or a piece of Lego, but, I mean, sleeping, <laughs> sleeping on a problem, sleeping on... Um, something that's still hanging in my mind as to what can I do here or what could I do differently there. Yeah. Um, and, and, and literally as I go into that, you know, that sort of mid space between consciousness and, and sleep, you know, um, just let that hang in my mental air. And it's amazing how, different things can look the next morning um mm -hmm. you know s sleep's super important so you know if ever i have broken sleep or whatever it's uh, it, it has a big influence on my day i must be honest i think you know sleep is massively important but um and and that can set you up or not for a day ahead which can sometimes set the tone but you know it things like that catastrophe challenge problems things going wrong they will 
they will always be temporary. Um, and I think we have choice about, um, was it Maya Angelou that said, you know, um, it might have been a million other people as well, but, you know, life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we react to it. And, yeah, yeah. and that, I think, is a really sound advice. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's it, really. I, I don't always succeed. Um, but when I put my mind to it and I focus, I remind myself it's not forever. It's not permanent. Um, you know, I sometimes ask myself, well, what's the worst that can happen? And then I importantly ask, and I do this with groups I work with as well, and what's the best that can happen? So what what's the possible good outcome from this challenge? You know, will it get me to work harder, work differently, work smarter, you know, behave differently in some way in the future that will eliminate or minimize this problem recurring. And, yes. you know, I think actually without mistakes, we, we would learn very little. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. So what about those days where you get to live more? And that's why I talk about getting to do more of the things that you want to do and less of the stuff that you don't want to do. What do those days mm. look like for you? Well, do you know what? I, I don't know if I'm going to sound a bit sad here, but <laughs> I, I, I love my work. I do love my work and and my work is a big part of me living to the full. Um, and, you know, you get these people that say, oh, you know, if I won the lottery, I, I wouldn't go back to work. Uh, sorry, I would, I would stay working. I'm not sure I would, uh, truth be told, but, but I would, I would do something. I would do something because, um, and, I, and I don't mean lounge on a yacht or something, but I mean something to continue spreading the messages that I spread because they're, they're too important to me. Um, and maybe this goes back almost, Joe, to where we began this conversation about living truth and, uh, and the fact that I'm now in a position where I can very authentically live and Um, speak my truth and bring that I'm in the fortunate position that I can bring that into the work I do and the change I can help um, create across businesses Um, I I am living my best life if you like Um, you know yes I think it is all about balance Um, you know it doesn't feel like living your best life when you've been sat in your office 12 hours Um, so I think you know combination of um, the sheep i love the sheep i love i absolutely love the sheep um you know the sheep walking the dog spending time with my wife you know some real quality time and sometimes it's just there's a combination of that quality conversation and the just actually just chilling out on the sofa and watching some drivel on the tv (laughs) that's really great too with a gin and tonic of course um and so those are the days, the days that I think are the best days for me is when I felt energized from everything I've done that day. Mm. Um, you know, the things that we all have to do things, especially when you're self-employed, we have to do th- things that drain us, sap our energy, but we have to do them. Mm. Um, those are the days that phew, you know, they're a bit sort of bleh, days, but, but, when I'm doing things that energize me, so maybe I'm creating material, maybe I'm delivering material. Um, uh, that part of my work is part of my best day, um, yeah. to be honest with you. So it's a whole multitude of things. Um, and, and it's so interesting because um, like a lot of people, you know, I, I, I generally holiday quite a lot. And, um, you know, I told you about my holiday repping days back in my 20s. And I've always loved to travel and, um, you know, for work and for pleasure. And um, and it's so interesting because with the house move in October, we hadn't booked a holiday. And, and I'm the one that goes, oh, God, we haven't got a holiday booked for six months. Like, we need to book something now because I, I like to have that sort of something to look forward to, something to look forward to. Yeah. And we hadn't got that with the house move and, and I'm absolutely okay with it. And, and of course, you know, the world situation has meant it's been a bit challenging when it's come to travel and so on. Um, but I'm absolutely okay at this moment in time with not having a holiday booked mm. at this moment in time, because, mm. you know, I do feel very, very lucky, very, very blessed with, um, with my life. And, uh, and, and so I've no real desire to do that. Um, mm. 
it, it I can have so much pleasure at home and at work. So I'm, I just feel very, very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. I, you've, you've painted a great, a great picture there. Um, especially with the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. It's been great talking to you today. Tell people how they can get in touch with you and find out more about you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, my website is um, jackiehandy.com. Um, so that's where you will find me. Um, on social media, so I'm under, again, Jackie Handy on YouTube. So I've got uh, some uh, some videos of observation. I've got some of my more official speaking engagements on there, um, which you'll also find on the website. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, so on LinkedIn, you'll find me as Jackie Handy, F-I-R-P. That's F for Freddie, I-R-P for Peter. Um, and, uh, and that's just because it's a, a, a recruitment institute that I'm part of. But, um, but you'll find mm -hmm. me. And uh, I am on Insta and I am on Twitter. But honestly, I don't do a whole lot on there. And, um, and I, I have, I will say um, one group that I run, which is called The Power of I on a Facebook group. And the power of I is basically a group where people can come in and ask and contribute to any of those awkward conversations, if you like, that we are sometimes frightened to have around inclusion. Um, it's designed as a real safe space opportunity for people to put in their thoughts and uh, comments and questions about all things diversity and inclusion. So it's called the power of I. And um, yeah, people are welcome to come in and join that too. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Jackie. Really enjoyed myself today. Thanks. Uh, likewise. Thank you, Joe. All this information is available in the show notes. If you go to powertolivemore.com forward slash, in this case, 173, then you'll find them there. And this week, again, it's a short one. I'm actually supposed to be on holiday and people keep telling me to stop working. But obviously, I have a weekly podcast and I can't not record my outro. Uh, so we're camping in a field in Kent. Uh, myself, a little Dodsey and her friend. And it's been really good, actually, apart from yesterday was really, really windy to the point where we had to pop across the field and peg down uh, a random tent that people had gone out and uh, we could see pegs flying and everything. So we thought we'd better go and rescue the tent for them. But other than that, it's been really lovely and warm and relaxing. And we're staying on an ice cream farm, which has had one of my colleagues laughing, imagining rows of cornettos planted in the fields. <laughs> it's not quite like that, but the girls are having ice cream every day, so that's a bonus. At this week's Canterbury Networking, we talked about using webinars for marketing, and we talked about how they are a really good way of people getting to know you personally, because they can hear you and often see you teaching whatever it is you're teaching them, and you can make offers as part of the webinar. So it's about online learning, giving people valuable content, but also you can use it as an opportunity to do a pitch about the product or the services that you offer. And so we were talking about how people can do that and the sorts of things that you need to think about in terms of putting those together. So I don't know if you use webinars for your own marketing, but if you don't, it might be something to consider. As I said, that was going to be short and sweet uh, on the basis that I need to at least pretend I'm not working. <laughs> so um, next week's Counterpoint Networking is not happening because it's a bank holiday in the UK. So that's the uh, 31st of August. And so we'll be back on the 7th of September, at which time we'll be talking about automation. If you're interested in coming along to that one, then go to counterpointnetworking.co.uk and look under events and you'll be able to register for that particular event. As ever, the show notes are at powertolivemore.com forward slash 173. And we look forward to speaking to you next week. Use your power to live more. 